Good evening, and welcome to the Pocosin City School Board Meeting for October 19, 2021. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order, but I would first like to welcome uh, Madeline Haddock and tell you a little bit about uh, her. She is a junior at Pocosin High School and will be serving as the school board representative for this school year. Maddie is an active member of the Pocosin High School Student Council, where she has held the position of vice president since 2018. She's a class representative for the class of 2023 for the Key Club, and she's also a member of the Leo Club, and a member of the Spanish Club, and a new member of the Excel Club. She has played on the Pocosin High School field hockey team since eighth grade, uh, spending three years on the varsity, uh, junior varsity team, where she held the captain's position last year, and one year on varsity. She's also been a team member of the Pocosin High School tennis team. As a school board representative, Madeline will be serving on the Pocosin High School Bullying Prevention Committee and the Pocosin High School's Principals Advisory Committee. This evening, Madeline will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and share an inspirational reading. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and liberty and justice for all. So for my inspirational reading tonight, I picked The Oak Tree by Johnny Ray Ryder Jr. A mighty wind blew night and day, it stole the oak tree's leaves away, then snapped its bows and pulled its bark until the oak was tired and stark. But still the oak tree held its ground while other trees fell all around. The weary wind gave up and spoke, how can you still be standing oak? The oak tree said, I know that you can break every branch of mine in two, carry every leaf away, shake my limbs and make me sway. But I have roots stretched in the earth, growing stronger since my birth. You'll never touch them for you see, they are the deepest part of me. Until today, I wasn't sure of just how much I could endure. But now I've found, with thanks to you, I'm stronger than I ever knew. Members, are there any additions or modifications to the agenda? No, ma'am, we do not. All right, very good. So next, we're going to recognize several special people, after which, if you would please stick around, we would like to have a break and meet with you. Is that okay with everybody? All righty, all right. So at this time, if Judy McCormick, president of the Coaching <coughs> Education Foundation and Mary Earl Stallings, secretary for PEF could come forward. We'd also like to invite Sydney Duty and Connor McGowan to come forward. Sydney Duty is an active member of the Key Club. Last semester, she had the privilege of working on the Pocosin Education Foundation's annual report. This opportunity taught her how to format materials in a visually appealing way that also makes it easy for readers to understand the information. She also learned how to organize things in a way that makes sense to the reader. Sydney loved this project because she was able to be creative while also still getting the task done. She enjoyed working with Mary Stallings from the PEF Foundation and heard about how the annual report is used as a marketing tool to raise funds for our schools. Working on the annual report was a big reason she decided to pursue a career in marketing because she realized how much she enjoyed applying her creative processes during projects. Along with Sydney, Connor McGowan also worked on the PEF annual report. Connor was born in Rhode Island and has attended the public schools here in Pocosin for the past nine years. Growing up with two very STEM interested parents, he has always aspired to achieve greatness from a young age 
And whether that be achieving a black belt in Taekwondo or being chosen to represent the eighth grade graduating class, his most recent and proud of these achievements is his admission to the governor's school. Connor is interested in computer science and Governor's School will offer him a great opportunity to learn more about advanced topics and prepare himself for college level learning. He all enjoys participating in the Pocosin High School varsity boys tennis team and in the past, the varsity cross country track team. He looks forward to hopefully participating in tennis this year and claiming his spot in the top five. Along with his rigorous academic schedule, he is working at the Blue Crab and Purple Pig restaurant. I am Mary Earl Stallings, and I want to thank you board members and Mr. Tillett for giving the Education Foundation this opportunity to acknowledge our creative uh, students who put together our 2020 annual report. And to give you a little background on this, everything's changing as we all know. And so back in the fall, I personally, along with several members of the PEF, decided it was time for a change to formulate or create a different annual report. Uh, different people involved, different printing, et cetera. Well, Mr. Tillett took the bull by the horn, so to speak, and he approached Connors and Sydney's marketing teacher, Mrs. Valerie LeBlanc. He asked her if she and her class would be willing to take on this awesome, challenging task to create a real learning-based project. And thankfully, Mrs. LeBlanc said yes, and thankfully, Connor and Sydney said yes. So I want to applaud them and tell you how hard they worked. They had skills, but as a result of this annual report, their skills were very much well developed. And I just had word that Mrs. LeBlanc is willing to take on this challenge again to create our 2021 report. So these students have really showcased what the marketing department can do and what the marketing teachers can do. For anyone, I know you board members have received a copy, but for those of you in the audience, I brought an extra one for several people. So just see me after the um, presentations and I'll be glad to give you one. Thank you so much, all of you. Hi, my name is Judy McCormick, and on behalf of the Bacosan Education Foundation and the Kiwanis Club, I would like to thank our school board and city council and the members of this community who are absolutely exemplary in supporting our fundraisers. We have one every fall, which is usually the last Saturday of October, which is a 5K run two mile walk and hopefully you've seen our signage posted all over the city and one right here uh, coming into City Hall. Um, then we have another one in the spring, which we have not been able to have for two springs in a row because of this COVID virus. But we are hoping beyond hope that we will have one next spring. The people in this community are unbelievably supportive of Pocosin City Public Schools. And we can't thank you enough. We, um, every penny that comes into Pocosin Education Foundation stays in the city of Pocosin, stays in the school system. I say this, we even, those of us on the board buy our own shirts, so we don't use any money that is part of the fundraising proceeds. Um, Mary and I both worked in the school system I was there 26 years, Mary was there more than that, 30 or 32 years. And a lot of us on the board have a passion for Pocosin City Schools and what we do. And so 
I am here unashamedly advertising our race on October 30. Um, I have several of these with me if anyone would like one before you leave this evening. I told the young teachers, so many of them are so young now, um, this little round thing right here, I didn't even know what it was, but it's called a QR code or something. <laughs> and so you can take your phone and you take a picture of it and you can actually register to be part of the event very quickly. So we were at the, some of us were at the um, primary school. We go into each, each school building and talk about the race to the faculties because they are the recipients of the proceeds that we get. And so I told them what I just told you. And I said, I, I didn't know what that was. It's because I'm old. But all of these young <laughs> teachers are probably in their 20s and 30s. And so <clears throat> we did our little song and dance about the race. And then um, I said, now don't forget, there'll be an envelope in the main office and you can put your checks in there when you register. And so one of the young teachers put her hand up and she said, why don't you ask how many of us have already registered <laughs> while I was talking? So I did. And there were like 10 hands went up and they used this little code right here and they had already registered. So it's, it expedites the process and I think for those of you who are more technologically sound than I, makes it quicker and, and easier. Thank you so, so much for all your support. This is our ninth year, I think, to um, uh, have the event, the 5K Run Two Mile Walk. And um, every year you guys just keep better and getting better and better. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all you do to help support us and in return, you support your teachers, you support your students, and you support this incredibly wonderful school system. Thank you. Thank you. Great. City Public Schools would like to extend a huge thank you to Pastor Bolds and Victory Church for an incredible donation. Victory Church covered the cost of all school supplies for PCPS students in kindergarten through second grade. The grand total of all supplies for students in kindergarten through second grade was $16,065.40. Just a small sample of items purchased include 477 boxes, 1,488 boxes of crayons, 6,150 glue sticks, 1,992 dry erase markers, in addition to many other supplies. According to a statement issued by Pastor Bolds, Victory Church understands the financial hardship that purchasing school supplies can put on our families. We feel very fortunate to be able to cover the cost of the school supplies for all of the primary school children. We consider it a great honor that we can be a blessing and support to our community. PCPS would like to acknowledge this extremely generous donation and the positive impact it will have on our students. Starting the school year with all of the necessary supplies is a, tr is a tremendous first step to a successful school year for all of our primary students. Thank you, Victory Church, from all of us at Pocosin City Public. Duty is a thoughtful young woman who works hard, young woman who works hard inside the classroom and out. She has challenged herself with numerous AP honors and dual enrollment, enrollment courses and has earned her spot in the National Honor Society and the National French Honor Society. She has excelled in her marketing coursework, prompting her to be an integral member of the DECA team where she took first place at the district level this year. Sydney has also been active in SCA, the FCCLA club, Key Club and Student to Student. For the past two years, she has performed with the Evolution Show Choir, 
and has managed the varsity volleyball team since her freshman year. Outside of school, this student has volunteered her time at church and other community fundraising events and has been employed by Tropical Smoothing Cafe. More notably, she has served as a student ambassador for Your Vibe for VA Arrive Alive campaign, where she was responsible for promoting safe driving habits among her peers. The student plans to attend a four-year university next fall, where she would like to continue her studies in marketing. Please join me in congratulating our October, October Student of the Month, Miss Sydney Duty.
wonderful. We, it's been way too long since we've been able to have a little meet and greet, and I can't tell you how much that means to all of us to be able to, to talk with you and with parents. All right, uh, we are, tonight we have a public hearing on Solar Power Services PPEA. Steve Pappas and Tara Woodruff will provide a presentation to the school board and you folks. Good evening, Vice Chair Sheeler and members of the school board. Tonight we're going to talk about the Solar Power Services um, PPEA, and I'm going to start by walking you through the RFP process. If you recall, in January, the school board approved the PPEA guidelines, so we had to follow that process for this RFP, which was a little different than some of the other processes that we have followed. During phase one of the PPEA process, we received four conceptual proposals from solar vendors. After the evaluations, the evaluation committee selected two of them. We had a variety of proposals from the four companies. Some were recodings of the roofs, some were recoverings, because during the RFP process, we asked them to put solar on our, on our schools and do any enhancements that were necessary to go the life of that process. So the next phase of the PPEA guidelines called for detailed proposals from the remaining two vendors, which was NCI Solar and Sun Tribe Solar. And through that process, Mr. Pappas and I spent a lot of time with the vendors, with Dominion Energy, to learn a lot about the process of putting solar on our roofs. And ultimately, the evaluation committee recommended that Sun Tribe Solar is the provider that is best suited to fulfill the needs of PCPS. Thank you. So what's interesting here is that this agreement uh, will install on our roofs, which will be the primary school, the high school, and of course the middle school. The middle school will have a new roof by virtue of the project being done now, and the other two schools mentioned, the high school and primary school, will each receive a recovering. The recovering will last for 25 years, which ensures that the solar life of the solar panels and the roofs coincide. The elementary school roof isn't that old, so ripping that off really wasn't a value to us to put a new roof on when we still have at least another 15 years or so life on that. Um, the maintenance of these solar panels will be facilitated by the solar provider. So we don't have to do anything with that. Um, and that's another benefit to us. And then last but not least is the educational value and the fact that to the best of my knowledge we'll be the only school in a quite a distance, the school division that has been able to facilitate this. But children in all of our schools will be able to lock in, log into a dashboard and really get a sense of what solar is doing. It's something that obviously people my age only learned through sunburns. They'll be able to see as they burn their eyes onto the screens of their computers. And then the timeline to get this done, as you can see, it's pretty aggressive, but uh, tonight is the public hearing. Tonight, hopefully, the school board will approve it after the public hearing. In November, pursuant to the rules of the PPEA guidelines, we will provide the city with a copy of the proposed contract. And then in December, uh, we will complete the agreement. Uh, in July of 2022, the primary and high school solar project should be done. And then as we get into 2023, the middle school, because you gotta actually finish the middle school to put the solar on it. And, and those two will run concurrently. And that concludes our sunny presentation. <laughs> All right. I'd like to open the public hearing on Solar Power Services PPEA. Uh, are, is there anyone who would like to speak on the topic this evening? Nobody? Solar Power. All right. Excellent. I want to close the public hearing on Solar Power Services PPEA. Presentations and reports, and Mr. Artie Tillett 
will give the superintendent's update. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Check testing one, two, three. All right, we're live. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I have too much nervous energy so I can't sit and talk at the same time. <laughs> so forgive me. Um, I have two topics uh, to chat with you about tonight. The first uh, is one that you've been used to now for many months, your uh, monthly COVID update. Uh, unfortunately, this is um, something we've had to do uh, since I've been here and before. Um, my predecessor uh, was involved in updating you regularly on what was going on with COVID. The, this is, a, um, I think, a good news report um, from uh, information that we're seeing now coming in from really around the country um, as it relates to COVID and transmission and, and uh, PCR rates. Uh, as you'll recall, this map, a um, picture is worth a thousand words, and you've seen this uh, in every report we've made this year. And it was solid red, deep red, all over the country uh, in July, uh, late July through uh, even last month's presentation with a couple of yellows. That, if you'll notice in the south and southwest along that corridor there, we're starting to see some, some uh, uh, substantial and moderate and even a spot or two in the uh, Midwest of low transmission rates, which is a good sign. Um, we're gonna talk specifically about numbers locally in a minute, but that map is changing you know, by the day, and, um, and that's good news. These are just the rates you're used to seeing, over 900,000 uh, cases in the state of Virginia, um, 13,391 deaths, and 37,767 hospitalizations as of Friday. Um, the good news is, and you'll see this is cases in Pocosin, um, we, that we have tracked from the beginning, and you'll notice that there is, start, we're starting to see that dip that we, that we started to see in other states, especially in the south, southwest, um, uh, several weeks ago. We're still, of course, in high transmission rate, 399.3 cases per 100,000. Um, the goal is to get below 100 case, cases per 100,000. Uh, but our percent positive rate uh, continues to drop. Um, that number, if you'll recall from this report that I've been making for a lot of months now, um, has been as high as 30 um, uh, PCR percentage points. And um, that number is now uh, at 11 and um, continuing to drop. So that's another good sign. Vaccination rates, these are vaccination rates locally uh, from a, uh, our primary target audience there from 12 to, uh, our 12 to 17 year olds at 46.9%. That number is creeping up um, slowly. But again, that, um, all the information tells uh, us that that number, the higher it gets, the more protected we are as a community. So we're certainly encouraging that and um, making available uh, clinics as uh, as, as they're scheduled around the region and sharing that information with our constituents. This is our dashboard that is available on our website and updated daily. And you'll notice from last year, we had 64 cases of COVID in our school system for the entire school year and with the Delta variant and its contagiousness. Um, we're running here two months of school 
um, at 94 cases. You'll see those in school site specific. We had one um, uh, outbreak last school year for the entire school year and already we've had four this year. Now an outbreak is defined as a certain number of cases in a period of time in a certain environment. And um, uh, two of these at least are from uh, an athletic team that, um, from athletic teams that had a, an outbreak within the population of that particular sport. These are kids who are currently quarantined and um, we've been asked by our board and others to uh, share that information by where the quarantine started. Uh, we don't always know where the COVID case came from. Hard to tell, maybe impossible, but at least we know where the quarantine starts. And so it helps us track what areas in our uh, sc school facilities um, and uh, transportation, for example, um, or athletics, where these uh, quarantines are taking place. These are kids currently learning virtually um, be, due to quarantine, and that number's fluctuated up and down uh, since the beginning of the school year. Flu shot clinic coming up on Wednesday, October the 20th, tomorrow. So if you haven't gotten your flu shot, run out and get you one. It's a lot of fun. Lena got six or seven shots last week. Um, questions, comments, uh, again, you guys are very much used to that data and information. We've tried to make it as consolidated as we can, but the good news is the trend data nationally, statewide, and regionally, and here in Pocosin is starting to head down. We believe we've plateaued uh, about a week and a half ago, so it looks like those numbers are, are, are heading in the right direction, and that's good news for all of us. Questions from the board? Okay, my second topic, much more fun to talk about. Um, I don't know why we're talking about this. <laughs> it's, my same, it's my same presentation. It's okay. Not that one. We have too many presentations. I don't even have a good joke on hand. Sorry. <laughs> That would be a joke. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Now we're getting clever. <laughs> you see how frustrating it is for our teachers when the technology doesn't work? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Now it's upside down. Everybody stand on your head. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Right there. That's it. For you at home, now it's time for a commercial break. Let's <laughs> hear from our sponsors. Presentation. What's that? Dan, like your presentation. You must not have liked it. <laughs> All right. Moving on to strategic planning. We've been uh, talking about this since I arrived in Pocosin, and of course we had to kick the can down the road last year due to um, COVID and the lack of data. And now we're in a place where we're ready to move forward, and it's, it's very exciting for those of us who, um, who geek out over um, teaching and learning. And um, so this is a process that um, will take us most of the year, um, but it, it's only the beginning because uh, strategic planning is a continual improvement model. It's cyclical. Everything you do, uh, you uh, plan, and we'll go through some of the steps of this in a few minutes, um, but it just continues. Uh, it never stops. And uh, a school division like Pocosin that has a long history of success uh, with student achievement, this is a very important part of that process. But it doesn't happen with just the folks who work in school. Um, in order for it to be a, 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 a program that has buy-in and has tentacles in the community and involves and, and um, uh, connects all elements of our community, it has to be a collaborative process. And it's one that we've strongly 
So in a nutshell, the purpose of strategic planning is to achieve organizational alignment, connect stakeholders to a common purpose, and to address areas for improvement. The why is um, the strategic planning process empowers our stakeholders, uh, such as parents, students, employees, city officials, business partners, school board members, and more to collaboratively, collaboratively shape the future of their school division. Through this process, the school division and community become partners in creating a three to five year plan to improve or enhance the schools. The shared sense of ownership enables the division to overcome obstacles and discover new possibilities for all students. The first part of the process requires a deep dive into data, which some people really enjoy and some people are scared to death of. But um, that process has already started. Um, we're, we'll be pouring into old data so that we can see trends of where we have been highly successful in areas that could use some improvement but we'll also be collecting new data. Now one of the challenges in this process, in this timing, is that some of the data that's very important in, in this process has been suspended over the last uh, couple of years with, with um, accreditation being waived and some of the data points that we're used to using to guide this process being unavailable. But we're still gonna pull as much data as we can. We'll get a lot of anecdotal data. We'll, uh, we'll get um, a lot of formative data from our teachers, as well as the, the summative data that we'll get from um, the state. Um, the next part of this, in addition to data dives and, and uh, analysis, is to find out what's in the minds and hearts of our community members, because a school division, a healthy school division, is really a representation of what your community wants and believes about their hopes and dreams for their children. And that's where this next step, which is a lot of fun actually, is focus groups. And we're going to be uh, uh, inviting members of the community and all um, parts of the community to come in and talk with us about what it is that they believe we're doing really well and should continue. And then those things that we ought to take a look at and, um, and analyze if it's working or if we could do something different or better. Um, and it'll be in all facets of, of our work, in our leadership, in our teaching and learning, our culture, our recruiting and operations. We're going we're gonna to really study all pieces of our DNA to find out what's working and what's not working. And again, it's a, it's a continual process. So one of the first things we're going to start to do is establish um, purpose and start to set some goals. When you start asking the question about what we're doing well and what we're not doing well, what you start to see is the, the big things show up. You'll start to find, oh, the kids are saying this, the parents are saying this, the community members are saying this, our staff is saying this, and then those big things end up showing up pretty quickly and they become apparent. And so we, we then set goals around those big rocks, those big ideas, and um, then we start to define the programs and outcomes that we're going to measure. What is it that will tell us if this is working or not? We're going to design um, and conduct assessments. We're going to see how to measure it. You know, I've heard my whole career, oh, this is a really great program. It's doing really, really well. Well, how do we know that? It might be because we just like it. Um, or it might be that it is actually providing some very um, high level learning or some uh, particular um, asset for our students. But we have to be able to measure those things. So part of strategic planning uh, is to find out if what we believe about a program or an initiative is, is really working or not. And then we, of course, document and, and um, uh, report these assessment findings. And then um, we make decisions. We make, and that's where your role comes in. Some of these decisions will be policy decisions. You'll find that some policies we have may be working and some not so well. We'll find that some initiatives, some uh, uh, major initiatives or even some minor programming that we've used to supplement a, an initiative is working or not. 
Um, and we really, it really, this really happens in four domains. It happens by defining the problem, and I won't read all this slide to you, but we didn't select the evidence and solutions. Then we implement our plan, and then we go back to adjust and measure, adjust and measure, adjust and measure. And uh, it's, a, like I said, a, a cyclical process. And the whole goal is to improve student outcomes. Now, the vast majority of this, or I will say typically in, in, in uh, strategic planning, a major portion of this are learning outcomes. What is it that our kids are supposed to learn, and have they learned them at the levels that we expect? But there are also parts of these outcomes that will be social and emotional. There'll be outcomes, there'll be targeted things that we're gonna work on that have to do with activities and supports for our students. It may involve um, more extracurricular uh, opportunities for kids. So a lot of things will come out of this. I'll just give you a, a segue. Um, in my former world, through this process, we found out that there was an interest in our community with a program called Dual Language, where students start learning two languages from kindergarten. And it's been going on around the country for many, many years. And if you track the data from those students, about 15 years worth of uh, data from all around the country, actually from around the world, of kids whose brain gets wired by learning two languages while they're acquiring the same information, the same math, the same um, science, the same social studies, and they just learn it in two languages. And then by third or fourth grade, when we start measuring their results on standardized testing like the SOLs, those kids typically outperform their classmates by 18, 20 percent almost across the board. These are just exciting things that we as a group, as a community, a community of people who value uh, learning for our children can get excited about and say, let's try this. It's, here's what the data tells us that happens. Now it's going to take buy-in, it's going to take parents and community saying, sign me up, I want to put my kid in that program. And, um, but that's just one tip of the iceberg of, of opportunities that we can create that should come out from these conversations um, in our community, among our community, about ways to, to uh, grow outcomes, improve outcomes for our kids. Um, today, um, stakeholders in the community received a survey that was sent out. We're going to continue to send the survey out to different groups. We're going to send, uh, if we missed anybody, we want everybody to get an opportunity to, to weigh in. Um, it asks some specific questions about what the schools are doing well and what areas we, we could work on. Um, and then we're going to compile all of this data. And uh, we have partnered with a company called K-12 Insight that's been do doing strategic planning for many, many years. And they will team up with us, use their expertise and their um, uh, uh, programming to help us compile the data and put it in all kinds of graphs and charts and ways to really dig in and find out what the community has said about um, our schools through this survey. But that's just the start. The um, next step is we're going to stand up a steering committee. We're going to put people uh, who represent different elements of the community uh, who are willing to serve to start pouring through this data with us so that we as a collective uh, community, a steering committee, can kind of guide and direct these conversations to tease out the important topics. Um, you, as our school board, as you well know, will be uh, intimately immersed in this process and be updated on a regular basis uh, as our progress is unfolding, things that are jumping out um, uh, at us through the either the data or through the um, uh, uh, information that we're collecting. And then the next step is we're going to build focus groups, groups of people who represent our community who are going to talk about uh, what Pocosin is doing well and areas that we should focus on uh, as we look to improve. From their perspective, we're going to talk to middle school kids. We're going to talk to high school kids. Um, we're going to have two parent focus groups. And we're going to uh, talk to groups of our staff not just teachers, but certainly teachers, paras, bus drivers, folks that serve our kids in our cafeteria, uh, our uh, maintenance crew, people who have a vested interest in Pocosin, but they may have a very different perspective than, than, than the person down the street. 
In addition to this, and this is something that K-12 will facilitate for us, so it's very objective. They're going to come in and ask these questions and ask for honest feedback. And then um, uh, our central leadership team is going to start to have coffees, um, informal meetings, inviting uh, folks in the community in to just chat. Talk with us about Pocosin schools. Some folks have a long history in Pocosin and can tell us a lot of what made Pocosin great. You know, I've had conversations with Judy and uh, Mary Earl and, and uh, so many others in the community who have deep roots here and can say this is one of the reasons that Pocosin does really well. We should always be thinking about that. And then we're going to have some insight from a middle school kid that, that's going to say, you know, tell it the um, uh, hand dryer in that bathroom down the hall is not working very good. And the lunch doesn't have enough salt or sugar in it. Um, you're going to get stuff like that. But you pull all that stuff together and what you find is, a, is you start to see themes of what is happening in Pocosin that's really, really good and we should celebrate and keep going and other things we really need to roll our sleeves up and work on. And then finally, uh, in February, we'll present, um, we'll put our leadership team together, steering team together, steering committee, and we will put together a draft document that will have all these elements. We'll then go to work on trying to clean that up and make it presentable and fancy. And, um, and then we're going to come to you um, uh, for final approval. Hopefully, we'll be updating you along the way. Our goal is to have this thing complete for our board me uh, meeting on April the 19th for your final approval. Um, you, again, will have lots of input along the way, but we hope to have it in its final stage to present to you then, and then we're going to blast it around all over the world and, um, and get to work. Um, we'll be doing a lot of the things along the way that we've always done and we'll tweak some things as we go. But this plan will really launch us out in the next three to five years as we start to do um, you know, incredible things uh, moving forward with, this, uh, with our uh, partners in the community for our children. So that's um, it in a nutshell. This is the benefits of this. You all get it. Um, it'll be very transparent. A lot of communication, um, and we want to harness the energy from our whole community moving forward. Um, I think I covered that, and now it's time for questions. I went long, sorry. Questions? When uh, the parents and community members are completing the survey, will they have an opportunity to say, you know, I really want to be on the, you know, the teams and the coffee groups and that kind of thing? Absolutely. Yeah. We haven't decided yet how it's best to, you know, to reach out to the community and invite folks in, mm -hmm. um, but we, uh, we're working on that, how yeah. we'll exactly yeah. get together to make sure we tease out all the, the represented groups in our community. Certainly we want to involve uh, business, um, businesses in our community that have a vested interest. Certainly our uh, philanthropic groups uh, like the PEF and Kiwanis and um, Lions and, and um, all the, the clubs and organizations that already connect with our schools. But um, short answer is we don't have an absolute way yet to, to do that. There's a lot of options, some, some through surveys. Are you willing to serve? Um, uh, but we'll, we'll land on that very soon. Very good question. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Tillett. And now we will hear from the Executive Director of Finance, Tara Woodruff, with the financial update. Good evening, Chair Sheeler and members of the school board. October is when we talk about impact aid and we survey families, so just wanted to talk about that for a few minutes. Um, federal funding, we have that in the budget, so. Um, as you know, the Impact Aid is the U.S. Department of Education program that provides financial assistance to local school divisions. And PCPS receives basic support payments for federally connected children, which are those who have parents or legal guardians in active duty military or work on federal property. Impact Aid funding is distributed based on the percentage of a school division's federally connected population. And for us, based on last year's survey, this was about 28% of our total student enrollment. And active duty military accounts for about 
of those students. We are required to compile information and report annually by January to support funding for the following fiscal year. Therefore, in order to, de to, to determine eligibility for students enrolled in our schools, we have to do an impact aid survey form every year. And as we started last year, we are doing this electronically again through the parent portal. So families should be familiar with filling out the forms um, this way. They've done some other forms already this year. The survey will be based on employment as of tomorrow, October 20th, and information will be emailed to families in the morning. They do require that we have a separate form for each student. So if you have multiple children, you will have to do one for each student. The form, we ask that you complete it as soon as possible, but hopefully no later than November 3rd. And we really appreciate everyone taking the time to complete these forms to assist in our efforts in securing this federal funding for our schools. And that concludes my report. Having it online is the best thing in the world. Thank you. We love that. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and now we will hear from the Executive Director of Operations, Pappas. Good evening, school board, Chairman Schuler, Mr. Tillett. So I've been taking you through these little photo sessions to see the progress of the middle school in case you haven't driven down Pocosin Avenue. And, um, but before I do that, I just want to give a shout out to all the bus drivers in Pocosin. It's a bus driver appreciation week. They're doing a great job. Um, some of the central office staff have helped make it a wonderful time for them this year. We've done a few special things for them, and they are really working hard under very difficult conditions given the shortage of bus drivers here in Pocosin as well as across the nation, but obviously here it's hurting us. So <clears throat> two months ago, you might have seen this, and... Now, you're seeing, this is section A, and section A was where the library was, if that makes sense to anybody, between the old section and the new section, and now we're gonna have the new, new section. This is the new, new section, which we will hopefully call the central section. Uh, section A again, which is the central section, this is after the slab was poured, and now the second story is on it, and you've been able to drive by and see a tremendous amount of progress happening there. And of course, you've noticed the difference between our very aesthetic plywood windows and the new and improved <laughs> windows uh, as you drive down, and it's really starting to take shape and starting to look like we'd like it to. And then, in the east wing, which, which, which was the new section, but it's not the new, new section, so it's the old, new section, <laughs> the, hopefully to be named the east wing as you go down the road towards uh, the muddy toe section, is, this is what it's starting, this is what it's starting to look like. Uh, it's coming together. It looks like a school. And that's the interior of a classroom, and um, that's the ceiling, but that's all the ceiling we could afford at the moment. No, we're just, we're just putting it in. But you can see the ductwork is up there. Those are LED lights that'll diffuse beautifully. It's really going to be sharp in the old new section. <laughs> Moving to food service, um, what's interesting is we've all heard about the supply chain problems, and we see all the container ships out in the west coast who can't get here and just when you thought <clears throat> toilet paper was back on the shelves <laughs> we now have a problem with school food service and uh, i'm just going to tell you right now menu offerings are going to vary from school to school in the not too distant future we've already developed our menus we did that eight months ago and we have a cycle menu so week one comes back around on week six, and so on and so forth. Well, unfortunately, 
with the supply ch chain issues, we are not getting the products that we need. Case in point, just, well, actually, that'll be the next slide. So <clears throat> this is interesting. I'm really happy that even, even um, a storm blows, even an ill wind blows some good. So what happened here is every year we get USDA foods, and I've talked to you about that before. But last year, we forayed into food processing. And you go, what is that? Normally, what we did is we ordered potatoes and cheese and carrots and apples and things like that, canned goods, et cetera, et cetera. Well, last year, we took a chunk of money on a flyer, just under 6,000 bucks, and we decided to have USDA chicken processed for us. That's live chickens going down the road on the eastern shore, and they stop off somewhere, and they are processed. Well, that processing of that chicken has really been a good wind for us, because that turned into 75 cases of chicken patties, of which there's 150 chicken patties in a case, 75 cases of chicken nuggets, and you can read. That's a lot of chicken. <laughs> And lucky for us, we only go through like eight cases of chicken every time a cycle goes through. So we're going to have some chicken longer than other people because we lucked out or plucked out. And so, so then what happens here is these shortages just in this week when we tried to order. Oh, and by the way, I just want to throw in this a little side. USDA food can only be used for our students. But we make meals for other people, whether it's catering or we serve boys and girls club meals. They can never eat any of our USDA food. Doesn't matter. All these French fries are USDA. We need to serve this person some French fries. He's not a student. We have to have a separate store of French fries. So aside from being a nightmare to, to keep track of, we have tried to now order, because it's the same cycle menu, and we can't get them the same food that we luckily had through our USDA commodities. So it's been challenging. It just makes for more work. Anyhow, this week alone, we tried to order 14 items. Believe me, we order hundreds of items. But this is just the beginning. 14 items that we tried to order, seven were substituted out. So we wanted five compartment trays. We got two compartment trays. We wanted 10 by 12 pieces of foil to put food in. We got post-it notes instead. You know, that's the kind of thing that's happening, and we have no control over it. Seven substitutes, seven substitutions were sent. Three items were currently out of stock with no substitution. They just said, oh, too bad. So we served air that day. And then four products from this point on are just simply unavailable. And that's what's happening in food service. And this is just the beginning. So hopefully the bananas that are on a boat out in California will still be ripe when they get here. Bon appetit. And that concludes my presentation. Amazing, yeah. Mr. Pappas, thank you very much. <laughs> and now Dr. Hill will uh, provide the instructional update for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pappas, for that comic <laughs> relief. We appreciate the levity. <laughs> so, Madam Chairperson, Superintendent Tillett, members of the board, um, guests and visitors, I have a brief instructional update for you this evening. Um, we have coming up very in the very near future parent-teacher conferences. So on November 2nd, we have those conferences. There will be no school for students. Um, and our teachers are going to offer our families both in-person and virtual options. So for our parents that have to work or who for social distancing requirements would prefer a virtual conference, we're going to afford them that opportunity. And of course, just on the heels of those conferences, November 10th is, uh, believe it or not, the end of the first quarter. 
already it, it doesn't seem possible so it'll be a good opportunity for us to have conversations with our parents about student progress where they are um, areas that we need to continue to focus on etc so we meet with our administrative teams generally usually monthly and so we've had an October 14th uh, meeting with our principals and our school board our uh, excuse me leadership team um, October 19th we met with our assistant principals and so the purpose of those meetings are to provide updates whether it be from the VDOE with growth assessments um, so we provide them with updates, we share information, we identify um, work toward our common goals established by our superintendent. Um, we re reflect on progress and areas where we might need to refocus and we problem solve as a collective. So sometimes it's a matter of, you know, a, a recent issue that we're working on is three of our schools were able to provide our staff with an unencumbered lunch and one of the schools that were not. So we put our collective heads together because we are a team and we're working to solve that problem so that we support all of our employees. Um, and of course, you know, we talk about where we need to reinforce and support. And another example, we are looking, uh, we do some forward planning. So on January 29th, we have a professional development day that's on the schedule. And so we already started talking with our administrators about what should that look like. Sometimes in years past, we've done more of a top-down approach where we might hire a speaker or offer professional development from um, the, the senior level. Um, and we recognize that it's not always a, a one-size-fits-all. So this year, what we have um, decided to do is for that particular day, offer a conference approach. So in each building, we're going to offer our employees an opportunity to learn from their colleagues. So it might be where we have certain staff who have an expertise or have been working on a certain program or project, and they'll offer sessions. And so it'll be a menu of items that um, teachers can select from. So we'll be uh, capitalizing on our internal expertise. It might be that we have ITRTs that are offering multiple sessions throughout the day virtually because we're in a situation where we don't have a dedicated ITRT um, for each building. So people will be able to um, self-select from either in-person sessions or virtual sessions. So hopefully their, um, that conference approach, the sharing of our internal expertise will give us an opportunity to highlight staff as well as for people to self-select uh, items, uh, sessions to attend that are of a personal interest to them. Um, instructional walkthroughs. We want to make a connection to the cycle of continuous improvement that our superintendent referenced. And so what we have done for many years is um, something that we call instructional walkthroughs. So while our instructional staff do have you know, formative and summative evaluations, a, um, a walkthrough is a five to 15 or 20 minute snapshot in a classroom. Um, sometimes it's done by internal administrative teams. Sometimes we have leadership from the school board office who join those teams. Um, so it can be one person, it could be a small team of four to five individuals. And what we do is we go into classrooms, we are looking for a snapshot. Um, it gives us a sense of what instructional strategies are occurring. Um, it helps us gauge the climate, um, relations between our teachers and our students. And then we always follow those up with a communication with teachers and it's just a one-stop snapshot very brief pulse point. So the data that's gathered from that process um, hopefully prompts meaningful discussions about teaching, um, how we can assist teachers in delivering instruction, and then we also look for ways to connect to professional development. So based on what we're seeing in those walkthroughs on those days, for example, the one in January, we might say, well, this is some very targeted professional development that we also want to offer in addition to maybe providing people with a menu of choice. So um, it gives us an opportunity to create that focus on um, making improvements in our instructional program and then we take those walk the data that we gather from those walkthroughs and it's connected to the strategic planning process. So it's very purposeful. 
And I would be remiss if we did not take this opportunity to celebrate our um, principals. October is National Principals Month. And our principals, I mean, obviously, all of our administrators, we, and we do have a day uh, later in the year we'll, where we will highlight and celebrate our sister principals. But our principals are passionate, they're innovative, and resourceful, and they have an immense impact on our students our staff and our community. So if our wonderful principals would kindly stand to be recognized. We appreciate all you do, so thank you very much. And that concludes my very brief presentation. So are there any questions from the board? I was wondering about Dr. Hill is uh, when you do the walkthroughs, are they planned so that everybody is expecting to be visited? And well, sometimes they're announced and sometimes they're unannounced. Um, <laughs> so, um, oh. you know, it sometimes when you do a walkthrough, for example, we have some new administrators. So it's a good opportunity for them to team with someone from the central office to go into classrooms. Sometimes they'll team with a reading specialist and we'll. Um, the particular walkthroughs during one month might be focused on literacy. Um, another focus might be math. So we try to give a balance. Sometimes we say to the whole building, you know, there's going to be walkthrough teams coming through periodically, and sometimes they're unannounced so that we get a nice cross reference of um, snapshots. That's a good question. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Very good. It is now time for public comment. And I believe we have one speaker today. Yes, we have Mr. David Jellison, please. All right. And uh, Mr. Jellison, uh, I know you've probably heard this before, but the time allotted to uh, a speaker will be three minutes, um, except that a motion to extend the time uh, can, can be in order. Does that sound like it'll work for you? Three minutes should be good. Okay. I may, I have uh, the uh, mask that I wanted to hand out to you to see what you'll actually approve for a substitute for the law mask. Sorry, I didn't bring you up the whole class, but um, um, that's just what came in the bag. Um, so, this is the clear mask that y'all approved. Um, I wouldn't put this on my child, and so I don't know. Uh, I don't know where the decision came from that, or if we did any uh, we did any research into that or test wearing on that. It's uh, it seems like a breathing hazard to me, like a like a suffocation hazard. Um, it fogs up. It's pretty nasty. Uh, we we tested it on this one. Um, the other mask option was a plastic cup. It's hard plastic. Uh, my son tried to wear that. And uh, as you know, he had a speech, he has speech therapy, uh, it's a delayed speech. Uh, so we were looking for an alternative to the, uh, to the cloth mask. Uh, and uh, that one, the whole weight of that mask sits on your nose. Once again, it seems to be a, uh, it also fogs up and it seems to be a, uh, just, it doesn't work. It, we, didn't, we didn't seem like we tested that very well. Um, so we asked for, uh, uh, earlier for, for better mass policies, uh, at the beginning of the school year. And, um, we were told that, uh, we mask the kids so we don't have to quarantine because if they're masked, they, not everybody has to quarantine. Uh, turns out to be not true apparently because my, my son had to mask, was masking and still had to quarantine for 10 days. Uh, apparently when we have lunch, we're not able to social distancing, uh, to do our social distancing So with the uh, mask on. So it, the plan kind of falls apart there when you know it, it negates the whole idea of wearing a mask all day. Um, <clears throat> so it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, my son is in speech therapy. Uh, three times a week now because he goes uh, at school twice a week and then we go out in town twice, uh, once a week. Uh, I have the notes here showing that he has regressed 
in his speech therapy. He is not getting better, he's, not, he's getting worse. So, um, exactly what I was worried about when I talked to y'all the first time. Um, the, talk to you, uh, Ms. Ms. Sheeler, I've talked to you a couple times. Um, keep telling me, the times you told me that you want to follow the letter of the law. Letter of the law, uh, according to the, uh, the mandate by the Commissioner of Health, uh, states exceptions to this order include any person who has a disability or meets at-risk criteria or those assisting such person, including individuals with individualized education programs. My son has an individualized uh, education program. He, you owe him an exception. And that's all I'm asking for. I'm asking for an exception to the rule. Um, I don't know what, what else to say. Uh, it doesn't say should get an exception or, or, or might get an exception or with a doctor's note or with, you know, with monitoring for four or six weeks and seeing if he re does regress. It doesn't say that. It says uh, exceptions to this ordering. So can you please give my son an exception to the mask mandate? That's all I'm asking for. I just, I don't want him to regress in his And he has, so thank you. That's all I have to Thank you, Mr. Jellison. brought up, along with Mr. Jellison, I spoke back in August, I think it was, concerning the masks, and the impression that we were given was that the masks were going to be revisited. I understand at this point, up till now, the trends were holding steady, but at this point, they're going down. So I strongly urge you to revisit the mask policies. This is affecting our children. It's abuse on our children. As you can see, I won't put a mask on my face except for work because I'm going to lose my job if I don't. And even then, I wear it under my chin, hanging off my ear, walk around without it as much as I can. Our children do not need to be in masks. Please re revisit this policy sooner than later. Thank you. <clears throat> Our consent agenda will be read by Vice Chair the items include approval of minutes of September's regular meeting and closed meeting, approval of minutes of October's workshop, approval of financial reports, approval of personnel action, and authorization to change appropriation and to accept and expend funds in accordance with attached re request. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. We have a second. Second. Any comments or? Anything like that? All right. Uh, Ms. Reimers, if you Mr. could take Ingram? the Mr. Ingram? Aye. Mr. Goodell? Aye. Mr. Freeman? Aye. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Mr. Childress? Aye. Vice Chair Hessel? Aye. Chairman Cheeler? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. All right. We have other matters for consideration. Um, the first of which is, cons is consideration for approval of the for the superintendent to execute a comprehensive agreement for solar power services. And Mr. Phillips, do you have anything more to say? Uh, nothing additional, uh, Madam Chair, just um, from the packet of information you all received and um, the presentation tonight, we're uh, recommending that we move forward with uh, 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 authorizing my signature on a contract with this very exciting project that is gonna be really good for, for Pocosin schools moving forward certainly um, save us some money in the long run. And, uh, and uh, uh, may I have a motion to approve? Seven. And a second? Second. Excellent. Any other comments anyone has? I have a comment on that. All right. Um, it, it appears that we spent three minutes talking about this solar plant. This is something that we've been, been in the works for several years and we got delayed with all the COVID junk. So. 
just know that we gave it due diligence and that's why we voted yes. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Farmers, you can call the vote. Mr. Ingram? Aye. Mr. Goodell? Aye. Mr. Freeman? Aye. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Mr. Childress? Aye. Vice Chair Hessel? Aye. Chairman Sheeler? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. All right, uh, our other matter for consideration is the approval of the proclamation for bus safety. Whereas public transportation helps hundreds of Pocosin's children arrive safely to and from school each day, the average school bus transports 54 students, replacing approximately 36 family vehicles, increasing the convenience and efficiency of student transportation. And whereas school buses are designed with safety measures, including bright colors, stop sign arms, cross view mirrors to avoid crashes and prevent injuries, and whereas the highest standards of school bus safety are maintained through vigorous driver training and certification requirements. And school bus transportation employees should be recognized instead fast commitment to safely transporting person students. Now therefore be it proclaimed on this 19th day of October in the year of 2021 by the school board of the city of Pocosin, Virginia that October 18th to the 22nd is recognized as school bus safety week in all Pocosin city public schools. Hooray for all the school bus drivers and the new one. <laughs> right, we are moving on to communications and other matters by the school board. And Madam Chair, we need to make up. I, you, you know what? I did that the last time. I apologize for that. That is true. <laughs> so do we have a motion to approve the school bus safety week? So moved. Second. Thank you. Next time we'll get it right. All right. Uh, unless we want to discuss it. Mr. Ingram? Aye. Mr. Goodell? Aye. Mr. Freeman? Aye. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Mr. Childress? Aye. Vice Chair Hessel? Aye. Chairman Sheeler? Aye. Proclamations passed 7 0. And now I'll move on to communications. And we'll start with Mr. Addict. So tonight I will just be reading about um, what's been happening in our school system recently and I got all these reports from our school principals. So starting with the primary school, Pocosin Primary School is off to a busy start for the 21-22 school year. Teachers and staff are doing their best to keep students safe, distance, and engaged in learning. All of our students are back in person five days a week and there are many smiles under our face mask. Our staff has prioritized social emotional well-being and explicitly teaching routines. Our students are trying very hard to follow the health and safety strategies, as well as learning academic skills. Our teachers are administrating fall assessments to obtain baseline data of students' current performance to gauge their progress over the school year. Bacosin Primary School PTO has planned the first family pumpkin patch for this coming Friday, and we are excited for this fall fun event. Our PTO is also looking forward to the November readathon to raise money for the PTO to support our students this year. Thank you for supporting the Boston Primary School. Now to the elementary school. PES is kicking off this week with the Spirit Week for National Bullying Prevention Month. Monday, there were students wearing favorite hats and today there were a lot of crazy socks. Wednesday is a unity day and the staff and students can wear orange. Thursday is say back off to bullies and clothing can be worn backwards. And Friday, we will be wearing pajamas and dreaming of a bully free school. Classes are able to enjoy eating lunch on the new picnic tables and in the back of the library and PES has the outdoor classroom where classes can also eat. It is encouraged that teachers and students enjoy the outdoors for eating and learning whenever possible. Some classes were able to release butterflies which have emerged from their chrysalis. The chrysalis were provided by a retired teacher in Master Garden, Susan Northcutt. On to the middle school. The Pocosin Middle School Library has hosted a free book giveaway for all PMS students. Every student was allowed to select one free book to keep. The PMS Library will also host a book fair during the month of November. 
PMS Do school counselors visited 6th, 7th, and 8th grade PE classes to share information regarding academic, personal, social, and career development support services, as well as the process for requesting individual meetings with their counselors. Our school counselors are also meeting one-on-one -on -one with students in all grade levels to conduct brief check-ins. Students are asked to share how, they, how their school year is going, how they feel about themselves, how connected they feel to their peers, if they have a trusted adult in school, goals for the year, and topics they may want to discuss further with their counselor. Bacosa Middle School will celebrate National Drug Prevention and Awareness Week, October 25th to the 29th. Students will have the opportunity to participate in theme spirit days and counselors will share healthy living and stress prevention tips in classroom lessons. And now to the Bacosan High School. Bacosan High School started the year off strong and we are very excited to be in person and learning five days a week within the building. The following are some of the many highlights that have occurred so far at PHS. Our homecoming week was full of excitement and spirit. Our students decorated floats to represent each class and their themes to participate in the homecoming parade. Our program activity at the football field was well attended and a lot of positive feedback was given by students and staff about the event. Our photo opportunity was given for homecoming was also well attended and produced a great memory to keep for those who participated. A special thanks goes out to Mr. and Ms. Bennett, Mr. and Ms. Morrison, and all class sponsors and staff that made homecoming week special. PHS was also awarded the Wells Fargo Cup during our homecoming game. The Wells Fargo Cup goes to the school in each group classification that has achieved the best overall record in VSHL state level competition in 27 sports and 12 academic activities. The state champion, state champion. Congratulations to all the athletic teams, band and chorus that have started this year performing at high school levels and continue to be successful. Clubs have started to form and meet within the building and projects are beginning to be planned by these organizations. This past week, our students successfully completed the PSAT. We are also partner partnering with Chick-fil-A to participate in their academy that will focus on developing leadership skills for our students. This group of 20 to 30 individuals will complete community progress throughout the year. Student Kate Lee was the first place winner of the Need for Speed Hypersonic Video Contest. Her winning video has been uploaded to UVA's Engineering's YouTube channel. Congratulations, Kate. Behavior expectation videos will be released soon, outlining behavior expectations for PHS students using our new VTSS matrix. This matrix helps guide students to know what positive behaviors we expect from them in certain locations. Our three focal points for positive behavior are being responsible, respectful, and being accepting. Last but not least, please be on the lookout for our weekly newsletter we send out to families and staff. This redesigned newsletter contains important information and dates for families and staff to keep up with all events and highlights that are going on at PHS. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maddie, for that updated report. Jane Groom. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to welcome aboard uh, Ms. Haddock to the, uh, as a representative and uh, want to congratulate uh, Sydney and Connor for their awards and also uh, you know Mr. Pillett as he was going through his presentation you know the community involvement and just want to thank uh, Victor Church and uh, Pocosin Education Foundation for everything that they've supplied to uh, the school system to the students thank you I just want to echo that. I want to thank Victory Church and uh, I also thank Mr. Allison for coming back and, and uh, sharing his feedback and uh, just to let him know it's not falling on deaf ears. Uh, I agree. I think there's something long term we do have to think about as far as um, you know when community infection rates dip or get back to, to low if things haven't changed. Is there something that you want to do as a school district to um, at certain accommodations or, or differences in our policy. Um, you know, we, I hate those days, but I'm always, I think we should think ahead. So um, you know, I'll bring it up with my colleagues. But I, I, you know, as I said, I just thank you for your courage. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. I'd just like to congratulate all our uh, award winners from the beginning of the meeting, Sydney Connor, and welcome, Maddie, to your school board position. 
Um, thank you, speakers, for speaking. It's hard to get up here in front and then be told you only have three minutes to communicate. That's one of our rules that I absolutely hate. I'd buy it. Um, I had the opportunity the other day. This is a perfect example of, of right place, right time moments. I had a guidance appointment with my daughter in high school. When I came out, Mr. Papp and Dr. Hill were standing out front. So, of course, I said hi when I walked by. They said, hey, you got a minute? I said, sure. And then Superintendent Tillett showed up. I got to see them do a presentation to the bus drivers in appreciation of everything they did. So that was pretty cool. So I kind of turned into a really quick board representative there. It was completely accidental. But our bus drivers do a great job. And with this being you know, bus driver appreciation, just, just thank you for hanging in there and doing the job you're doing to getting our kids to school safely. And then lastly, um, I'd just like to thank our teachers again. Um, one of the things that makes Pocosin great is our staff. And, and Ms. McCormick alluded to at the beginning. Um, you know, she, she served here, she said, 26 years. And I graduated from Pocosin High School in 1990. My daughter's going to graduate this year. And, and the one thing that's been consistent all that time is the quality of our teachers. And they do an outstanding job. And even under some rough, con rough conditions, I know the teachers at the elementary school right now are working through their lunches. But that's for the betterment of our students. And it's, a, it's a not a great situation, but that's what makes Pocosin so great is our teachers go above and beyond to care for our students. Thank you, teachers and staff, for, for doing the job that you do. Great. A couple things tonight. Um, I wanted to, again, congratulate Mr. Roberts and the, and the high school on the Wells Fargo Cup. Having been involved in athletics for many, many years, uh, Dr. Hahn, for him to come and administer that, um, that, that award is a tremendous honor for our school system. That is the highly heralded of awards that you can get as a school district. So the Wells Fargo Cup is a, a tremendous accomplishment by so many uh, wonderful coaches and staff members and, uh, and student athletes. Um, the survey that went out, we, you know, Cosin does a great job of getting um, support um, with that endeavor. So, you know, we asked uh, for you know, participation there by our parents um, and business folks to complete that survey in its entirety. Um, I, Ms. McCormick uh, recognized the event on October the 30th. Um, it begins at 8 o'clock, and we will take, you know, same-day registrations, you know, that morning. Um, but I tell you one thing, you know, Ms. McCormick's retired now, but she has an unbelievably gift for, you know, getting sponsors to donate. As of this afternoon, we were up to 45 different sponsors from across our little community, and... Um, I think it's just a testament to our school system. Um, like I said, it's, there's a college out there that could recruit her for fundraising efforts, and their, their, endowment, their endowment may double. Um, I hope she doesn't go that path because you know, her and her team do a phenomenal job. I've been the school board liaison uh, for many years now, um, and uh, it's just, a, just an unbelievably um, great group of folks to be around. And again, 100% of the funds go back to represent our schools. We talked about the uh, the donation from Victory Church. I was in the primary school, and a, uh, a parent, you know, told the teacher how uh, appreciative they were of the fact that Victory Christian Schools uh, provided, you know, uh, the resources. Because if you don't know, if you have a student attending school, you normally have to purchase those supplies. Um, and Victory Church played a major role in helping uh, some folks in our community. You know, with that so. Uh, Mr. Freeman touched on it as well. You know, we can't thank our teachers enough for the role that they're playing. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to do tonight is just make sure that if any community members have asked me countless times about different roles they can play in the school system, you can become a substitute. That is a major, major need for us right now. Um, our teachers are having to work through their lunch breaks. They're not getting proper planning periods. Uh, because of the severe shortage um, for substitute teachers. So, um, you know, one of the things that I've been telling folks in our community is, you know, apply for a substitute teacher job. And I can remember going through high school, and you used to love when a substitute was in the classroom some days. But <laughs> it's a very difficult job, and it doesn't pay well. I think we all know that. But it's a huge void right now um, in our community. Um, the one thing Pocosin folks do is, you know, they want to find ways to help. That's, that's a huge way to help right now is to become a substitute teacher. So um, that's all I've got. Sorry for the dissertation tonight. Thanks. Thank you so much. You said much of what we all wanted to say.
Mr. Childress. I'd like to thank Maddie, Sydney, Connor, Education Foundation, and Victory Church just for helping out with the community and the schools. Coming to the end of the first quarter, the COVID numbers and quarantine numbers are not exactly where we want them. I'd like to thank the teacher, staff, parents for your dedication to help us still get through this school with what we're having to deal with. Your dedication has helped us kind of start moving from the planning of COVID and work through the rough areas of it and actually go about with school. And now with that being planned and y'all's dedication, I look forward to getting back to the nuts and bolts, like I already said, and for improving our kids' education. And I'd like to also say happy National Principals Month again one more time. Thank you, principals. I'm going to say what all of you all said was spot on. I agree 100%. Um, the only thing I have to look at, Artie, you said earlier how important data is. And I know you read the proclamation about, about buses. And when, when we look at all of the spots where our students are, are getting exposed, to, to know that bus is number, was, has been eight and that's the lowest one, that's a testament to all the bus drivers that are doing Steve to wipe them down and keep them clean. And to me, that, that speaks so much. So thank you, everybody, um, teachers, you know, you all nailed it, but just keep on keeping on. Excellent. My colleagues have been very eloquent this evening. Uh, all I have is an update on, uh, which is good news, on the New Horizons Woodside Lane CTE campus. There was a ribbon cutting ceremony uh, last month, which celebrated the partnership with uh, Dominion Energy and the NEED Project, and it was a celebration, applauding the newly installed solar panel at the Woodside facility, where uh, students uh, can study the high-tech, fast-growing solar energy field, as you know, partners with, uh, with uh, New Horizons, and it's always exciting to see what they've got going on. Uh, the Woodside CTE campus was chosen as one of 16 schools across the country to host the Solar for Students project. So uh, Mr. Casey Roberts, who's director of New Horizon, uh, wrapped up the uh, presentation with a quote by Peter Drucker that the best way to predict the future is to create it. It's always exciting to see what he's got going on over there. That's all I have for this evening. Um, do we have any material for board review? No, ma'am, we do not. No closed session following the meeting this evening, so that we can be adjourned.